and it says got it so wouldn't be without it as they say so let me just go to my phone because there may be some messages that come up on the phone click on there and wait for any comments i've got one person with me shan <laughs> from canada and it might be it might turn out to be um, just a live conversation between her and my good self but if anybody's listening everybody was invited to come on and ask questions of me and i'm not saying i know the answers but um, I've got quite a bit of knowledge on the different aspects of what health is. Um, we could maybe just discuss things together, not nothing really personal, to see if we come up, come up with some solutions. Because I think where two or more or, or more are gathered, is almost like some sort of intuitive force comes in to provide inspiration and guidance. That's the way I see it, anyway. So on that note, what I'm going to do is. I'm just going to stick this PowerPoint presentation up just to explain to anybody who's watching in and doesn't feel like coming on what this is all about. So bear with me one second. So I've got that there. And then if I do the share screen scenario. Share screen. And then go to here. I'll just explain what this is all about. It's called the I am approach to health and well-being because I am, for anybody who's into spirituality and metaphysics, the I am presence is supposed to be the source creator. You know, in physical terms, the Big Bang or the thing that created the Big Bang. Uh, but from my point of view, I am stands for innate. That means born, you're born with these things natural to you. Assets. That means focusing on what's strong in you and not what's wrong with you. And management is the regulation of all the forces that impact upon us throughout our life. So really, this is about turning away from ex expert, external expert opinion and really coming away from intellect, which is... Um, is basically a con job. <laughs> you know, we're filled with all these programs and condition that probably have guided us away from who we really are. And so the I am approach is to put you back in touch with who you are and to find out where you've been sort of misguided, maybe, and misdirected away from your true power. So it's not to cause trouble. It's just that more and more people are starting to have more confidence in themselves uh, and taking actions based upon how they truly feel from deep within, rather than listening to all the market forces that go on outside. So, and I'm Dr. Joe Delaney. I'm not a prescribing of medication doctor. I've got a PhD in medicine, but I've got a lot of health sort of qualifications as well, like um, remedial massage therapy, Reiki healing, um, spiritual healing, all these different sorts of things, uh, sports and exercise science. I've got quite a sort of um, reasonable background in non-medical interventions. So that's where I'm coming from. I've got no arguments at all with medicine. If medicine's used in the right amount at the right time for the right condition, no problem at all. But I do feel that we can look within and find non-medical things, if you like, lifestyle choices that can actually change the way our nervous system works and help us to improve the quality of our life, especially the function of our immune systems as well. So that's what the I am approach is. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through this. And then if, if Shannon's still here, I'm going to bring her on live. I'm going to talk about things <laughs> because I sent out an open invitation to people. But, you know, I understand their reluctance to come on board because I can be fright frightening at times. <laughs> so my PhD was basically about this thing here. This is what's called the caduceus. And in the way I understand things, really, 
It's a representation of the human being. And we're born down this end here. We come in as a reasonably blank slate. And then if we get it right, we sort of ascend or evolve through these different sort of expanding loops, you know, and these loops are associated in Oriental science with what's called the seven chakras, but in, in Western uh, medicine, they're associated with the seven major endocrine glands. Starting off here, and they're also associated with instincts. These are the base instincts. And when I say base, I just mean that these are the most powerful ones. This is associated with personal protection and defense, and that's associated with the hormone adrenaline or epinephrine, and it's associated with the adrenal glands. Then we move up as we grow, and then the sex organs come online. Then and these are the gonads, the ovaries in the female, and the uh, go and um, the the testicles, if you like, in that area in the male. And so if we get through those there, then we move up into society. So we're sort of going outwards and expanding and just growing through the various stages. So we'll be coming, if you like, if we're all balanced, we become sages in stages. I never made that up. I stole it from somewhere. I can't remember where it was. But uh, yeah, we just grow in understanding. We grow in uh, expanding. Our consciousness expands. We start to understand how the world operates. And then we move here into the next phase here. Oh, by the way, so the gonads are associated, obviously, with the sex hormones. Um, estrogen and testosterone. Now, the thing is, both males and females have different proportions of both those hormones because within us, and I'm saying male and female, that's when we're born here, we'll know whether we're male and female, but then we move up then from the sexual characteristics into the gender characteristics. Now, it's very possible that some males may have more feminine qualities or feminine hormones or, or feminine feelings, you know. So that's perfectly fine, um, you know, because they will have different skills, different attributes and stuff like that, really. So in order, to, you know, the best thing to do is really is to dig deep within and just sort of feel your way into um, whether your balance is more inclined towards a masculine side than a feminine side. So that's no problem at all. There's no argument against. Then we move up then to the solar plexus chakra and all the um, personal power resides in this solar plexus chakra. And that's associated with the, um, the organs of energy production, like the pancreas, you know, for insulin and glucagon, the liver, the stomach, and especially the spleen. Because the spleen's almost like a forgotten organ. We know that it cleans the body, but it's also very, very important for energy production and also for um, immune system function. So believe it or not, the spleen works with the next chakra, which is the heart chakra, to main, maintain a healthy balance and main, maintain uh, make sure that our immune system is working to its full capacity. So the heart chakra then is associated with the thymus gland, and that again is to do with the immune system. Then we move up to the throat chakra, and so we've got the thyroid hormone. So all, again, energy, parathyroid hormones, that's all to do with really calcium and electrolyte balance and all this sort of stuff. Then we move up to an in, the, the master gland, or so-called, that's the pituitary gland, and there's a lot of hormonal regulation that goes on there. And then finally, we move up to the crown chakra. And the crown chakra is associated with a gland called the pineal or the pineal gland. And that's really all to do with biorhythms. And there's a lot of people who feel that in some way, the pineal gland has almost been um, put out of action, if you like, or hijacked. Uh, but it seems to be coming back online now. And there's a hormone produced there called uh, melatonin. And that's really to do with sleep and biorhythms and stuff. And more and more now, people are beginning to realize that the 24-7, 9 till 5, work as hard as you can sort of approach to life seems to be upside down and back to front. So more people are sort of taking more time off if they can afford to and getting into more rest and relaxation and recovery and recuperation and almost being reset to their natural biorhythms 
rather than the externally imposed sort of things. I didn't know I was going on about all this, but um, I'll just whiz through this. My job, really, because I was very, very ill for a long time. I succumbed to alcoholism. Uh, I lost everything, really. And in the end, I was that ill. Uh, I, I made a couple of a serious attempts to do myself in. Um, they failed. And I see now that probably failed for a reason because I was very, very unwell for a long time. I'd come down from healthy. I don't know whether I was ever, ever healthy, to be honest. But generally speaking, I was coping, gritting my teeth and getting on with it. And as the stress of life increased, I had to take alcohol then just to try and live uh, a normal life and work. But I was struggling for a long time. And then suddenly, really, it all collapsed, you know. And I sort of see that's the collapse, really, you know, was actually a gift. You know, some people call that the gift of desperation because something happened to me in that in that process that uh, showed me and helped me to realize that maybe I was living everybody else's life and uh, not my own life, you know, based upon how I really felt and how I really thought. So that's why I'm sort of enthusiastic about passing this message on, because I've been to this place and step by step and one day at a time, I've managed to sort of come back up here, right? I think I'm up here now. But the way I feel, generally speaking, is I think I'm getting back more and more into the, the healthy zone. So I feel most of the time, I feel reasonably emotionally balanced and clear-minded, but sometimes I don't. But I can feel now that when I don't feel like that, I've got a set of tools now, right, which I can sort of put into operation to take a big step back I start to care for myself a bit better, you know, because I have a tendency to push myself too much. And also I find it really difficult to say no to people, but I'm much better than I used to be. So that's just a, a little bit about myself. And I won't go through this, but this is what the I am approach is really. It's interior or innate asset management. It focus on what's strong within the individual and not what's going wrong. And in the society that we live in, in the West, really, we focus on the negative things. We focus on the deficits. And we don't really focus on the natural skills and attributes of people. We just tell them that they're no good at something. And they spend all their energy trying to improve something that they're naturally not good at. And, you know, and I see that if we all focused on what's strong in us, we'd have loads of energy. We'd feel creative. We'd be enthusiastic because we were working with our natural abilities. And then if stuff we can't do, there'd be somebody else in the team or in the group who would be good at that, really. So this is about individuals working together. I say souls because I think the I am approach is really based upon something deeper, but actually more expanded than intellect or logic. And it's deliberately developmental because as we take steps forward, not only do we start to ascend and grow, but we become more emotionally secure. We get more courage and strength. We get more energy and we can actually start to do the things that we love and say no to the things that we don't love. But it, it, it takes time. It gives us, uh, we need the opportunity to create space and to be able to sit and be honest with ourselves. And I've found that the only way I can be honest with myself is by talking it through with somebody else. I need to share my feelings at depth and my thoughts with somebody else because left to my own devices, right? I'm real. I'm a real danger to myself. I have all sorts of self-destructive urges in me. And I realize that by talking it through with maybe somebody who's been through the process, then they can actually reflect back to us how they feel we're going. I'm not looking for advice from anybody else. I'm just looking for somebody who will listen and, you know, just give their honest opinion, right? And because what I honestly believe is the real advice will come from within the individual themselves, really. And uh, the I am approach, it's a fusion of ancient wisdom and modern knowledge, you know, and I've spent over the last nearly 35 years now, I've spent uh, a lot of time looking deeply into the sort of indigenous traditional med medicines of the world, uh, especially ancient Egypt. Uh, but also Aboriginal tribes from Australia, the Maoris and the South American tribes as well. So I've looked at all these different sorts of things. And basically they're saying the same thing that what you're looking for is under your nose, right? It's just from there to there. And it's basically in your heart of hearts. 
And I didn't understand all this because when people started to talk to me like this, being a biomedical scientist, I would think, what a load of old crap. You know, they talk to, talk to me about things like Tai Chi and Qigong and yoga, and my head would be blocking them off. And that's because I was so closed minded and I thought I knew what I was talking about. And as I've shared many, many times, the person who was guiding me, he said, Joe, have you ever heard the expression, um, no all knows, I'll leave you to fill the bag. He said, and I said, yes, I've heard that expression. He said, Joe, it's you. He said, because every time I say something, you say, I know. And it's clear to me that you might have loads of qualifications and know a lot about biomedical science and medicine. He said, but about yourself, you don't know anything because you've just tried to take your life. <laughs> and that, <laughs> I laugh now, but I, there was silence, right? And I thought, who is this person, right? Who does he think he's talking to? But I realized that he was right, you know, that everything I had, all my qualifications, all my knowledge, all my intellect and all that nonsense, right? Right. It had no power whatsoever to help me to improve the quality of my life. And he said, basically, you need to get out of your head and into your heart. And that's when my process and journey of recovery started, really. And that's what I try and do. I try and pass that on. You know, and if there's anybody watching now and they've not heard it before, because I do say I do repeat a lot because um, I never know who's new to the thing. But I would say to anybody that the most important thing I discovered from my PhD was just become aware of your breathing. And that's it, really. Because the quantity of our breathing and the quality of the breath, right, is so important. And that's why I, I um, you know, help people to get back to heart-centered breathing. Actually, it's heart and tummy-centered breathing. And what I do is a meditation called Cradling the Sacred Child. And it's basically where you imagine you've got a child. If you don't like children, it could be a pet. If you don't like children and pets, Put your wallet there, you know, something that makes you feel good, right? But it's the feeling that's important. So it's the breathe in this feeling in two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five. And if you really, really focus on feelings first, your head starts to cl um, calm down. It starts to become less demanding. You start to get more space. It's called mindfulness, actually. It's a way to get into mindfulness. And then, like me, lots of people start to see things a lot more clearly and realize, if you like, the errors of their ways, you know, or the misdirected uh, way their mind or their, or their head has been guiding them, you know. And, and I see now that um, it's almost, when I look at it now, I can't identify with that person that I used to be. I'm much, much happier than myself. Um but you no, know, there's always something new to learn. And it's holistic. The I am approach is holistic, meaning it takes absolutely everything into account and doesn't deny anything. So what was that last thing on there? Oh, yeah, that's what I call it. Because I like playing around with words. It's wholesome. So there's a nutritional element there as well. It's wholehearted because I see now I was only ever leading a half-hearted life. And it's a whole person approach to whole health. And it deals with these four quadrants, if you like, or four intelligences, the physical, and that's where modern medicine generally focuses. This is the sort of biomedical model. But there's also the emotional side, which we tend not to look at, or lots of people repress that side of things. But this is the biomedical model, really, and it brings in some sort of psychology. So it became biopsychosocial, but it was basically these two over here that were forgotten. And when I say spiritual, I'm not talking about religion. You know, if you know, it can be if, if you're a religious person and you know you're you're using techniques that make you feel whole, healthy, and helpful and everything else, then great, carry on. But if we miss any of these out, I honestly see that we can't become a whole person, really. And this is where I was, really. I was just basically living on this side, suppressing all my emotions with drink and closing my throat down and pretending I was coping. And about spirituality, you know, spirituality to me meant religion. And because my life was so crap, I sort of closed the gate on that a long time ago. But as I say, 
I'd, I'd call myself, I suppose, now a spiritual but not religious person, you know. And spirituality to me means nothing more than understanding energetics. This is about energy management and time management. So that's what the I am approach is. And this bit here is one, two, three, four, number five. This is the fifth element, and that's you. We are the fifth element if we understand that if we get practice techniques to bring us into balance in these four quadrants, then I don't think there's anything more um, more that a human being person can be. And the other thing is, it's it's not a static process. It's a dynamic process. I'll just shift this over here. It's a dynamic process, but rather than starting with the physical, we start with the, um, the spiritual dimension, the vital dimension. And then that then informs our emotional state then. And our emotional state then then informs our, our mental, uh, our thinking. And then from there then, our thinking then can make the decision to pass the information into our physical body. So that's how the I am approach works. It's rather the other way around than medicine, because what medicine tends to do is it will try and change the biochemical constitution of the person by um, by giving chemicals and stuff like that, you know. Not that I'm opposed to that when used at the right time, in the right con concentration for the right decision. And by the way, uh, if there's anything that you get from this and you want to change things, it's always best and wise to talk things through with your current health professional. You know, that's so important for me to mention that because please don't say Dr. Joe told me <laughs> because I'll deny it. And oh, look, I just put these some of the references that actually inform the I am approach. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. So these are what's called very powerful evidence based references that back up everything that I'm talking about, really. So I'm not just making this stuff up. These are the things that I've researched and practiced. And, you know, and by the way, you know, I'm 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 completely fallible like everybody else because I'm human and I'm just trying to learn myself. You know, I wake up every morning and I just feel that I'm just scratching the surface. But, you know, it's more exciting that way because I'm always sort of waiting. I wonder what's going to emerge today. And I feel confident in myself that I'd be able to deal with most things that come along completely different from the old Joe who just couldn't cope with anything and just needed to get as much drink and other substances down him to take the feelings away. So uh, who am I? I'll probably spend the rest of the, the hour on this now. <laughs> so I'm a consultant principal lecturer in integrative health and medicine. I'm a member of the uh, British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. My PhD basically looked at the relationship between the heart and the brain. You know, and I've got all these sort of qualifications. I just put this up here just to say that even though I sort of mess around a lot and tell a lot of jokes and I'm very lighthearted about things, there's an underlying seriousness to me and I am a proper scientist, you know. And there's my PhD. And this is, uh, I'm in, you know, the International Society of Autonomic Neuroscience. And these are two highly credible and highly well-known um, scientific societies and uh, global societies. And this is what I found out, you know, I'm, I've got some international renown for finding out and publishing this a long time ago. But what I found was that this is, this is the way the heart works, if you like, or heart power or heart flexibility. And this is somebody, well, it's me actually, breathing at 12 breaths per minute. So the bigger the hump here, the more flexibility and the more power that we have. So this is really an empowering technique. And when we get relaxed and we're able then to breathe at nine breaths per minute, you can see here that the, the mountain rises, but the miracle happens at six breaths per minute. And what actually happens, the heart power increases exponentially. And that's because there's two sides of the nervous system that are in operation, right? And one side is a break. I won't go into the two technical details. One side's a break and one side's an accelerator, or if you like, the gas. And what's ideally, if, if we're going to drive our body in the correct way, we should use a bit of gas and a bit of brake very smoothly. 
and then we don't burn out we don't use energy so foolishly and all those sort of things and then we can clearly see around enjoy the journey and stuff but when we're in stress right we tend to go into the defensive and fight and flight and all those things all those positive attributes dissolve away very very quickly so breathing become aware of your breathing and if you want to find out more information about this if you go to the institute of heart math so that's heart m-a-t-h if you google heart math they've got loads and loads and loads of information and i started my studying and my research about the same time as they did you know and i've come across them um a lot you know and they're genuine people and there's lots and lots of information on there that you can find out about really and that's what it's about it's about that thing there which is the brain and it's about that lovely thing there and generally speaking what we do is when we're stressed we try and use our brain to impact upon our body but in actual fact the i am approach works exactly the opposite way around it regulates the way the heart beats which sends signals back to our brain which change the way our brain waves work and it comes out of what's called beta brain wave state into something called an alpha or alpha theta state and in that state we feel much more relaxed our body's more relaxed we're more cool calm and collected and we can make clearer decisions so really it's not about using our heads first and foremost it's about using our heart and this is relatively new science it's it's turning the world of science and cognitive behavioral therapies up on its head not that I'm knocking CBT and stuff like that. That's very important. If CBT can help to bring you to the heart and understand it, then it's doing a good job as well. So I don't know what I've got here because, uh, oh, yeah, people say to me, you know, what do you actually do? Can you explain it simply? I say, certainly, I'm a consultant in psycho neuro endocrino immunohematology, and they don't ask me any more questions after that. <laughs> and all that simply means is, P here means psychology, but it also means perception. And the way we see the world, and I'll show you a little thing when we go on later on, the way we see the world will then translate into electrical signals that pass through our nervous system. Those signals, to the degree that we see the world, our perception, will send information to our endocrine glands and all the secretory cells of the body that will then push substances out into our hematology and our immune system. And that's the way that stem cells work. The biochemical and chemical information that our stem cells receive make us because it impacts then the way our, our DNA expresses itself. So rather than change down here, I mean, there's ways that you can modify the DNA and the way DNA works. You, you can have injections and things like that. But that possibly with this new understanding is probably not the way to go forward. Not that I'm against anything like that, but I think that this new understanding of how it's more really to do with our perceptual mechanisms sending signals to our body, maybe if we can understand this more, we can use less sort of, um, less possibly destructive techniques, you know, because science moves on, medical science moves on, and this is quite a new field where we're really moving out of logic and into more of an intuitive dimension, really, and guidance from, from depth, the depth of ourselves. I hope I'm making sense here, but um, let's have a go. So, yeah, that's how we do it. I, I won't spend too much time on this because I, I have done this before. And if you want to find out, you know, I've got a lot of these on my YouTube. It's called uh, Getting Real with Dr. Joe. They're up on the YouTube channel. Um our our talks and discussions and not discussions just talks on this stuff so by all means go and have a look at that so yeah we receive information from our uh, visual auditory kinesthetic olfactory and gustatory the five senses comes in there goes into our memory banks to pattern match have we seen this thing before if it represents a threat we'll go on to the defensive and then our body will tense up and go into fight mode but if we can nip this in the bud here right 
when we've done this memory recall and say, hang on, is it really a threat? You know, when you open your email in the morning and there's a hundred emails and suddenly you can feel the grip in your guts and your blood pressure rises and everything. Is it really, really worth getting all het up about it? And most people are saying now, oh, no, it's just not worth it. My health and my well-being is more important. So it's by changing our perception that we can change the way our DNA expresses itself and we can create new neural pathways and networks in our brain because we can change the way our brain waves work by changing the way our heart works, you know. And this is sort of revolutionary. It's um, it's not easily accepted by medicine for various reasons. Shut up, Joseph. Now, don't say anything. <laughs> it's getting into trouble. But, you know, things are starting to change because the people who are working in the medical fields and the NHS, they're becoming stressed to the gills now. And they're also looking for different ways to go about things. So, you know, maybe at some level, this is all meant for a purpose. Back, oh, there's all the um, the things there. Don't worry about that. Uh, I'm not going to go into that there, but there's some sort of... This is all up on the YouTube, you know, and explaining how this is the brain, this is the sinoatrial node of the heart, how through breathing we can actually change the way these two uh, nerves work, really. And then it sends... By using breathing and positive emotion... We can actually bring in this smoother, more coherent electrical circuitry. And then we can cause the heart to work in a more coherent way. And it sends coherent signals back to our brain and everything starts to change around. Yeah, and it's the way you look at it, really, you know, that's we need to. We need some oomph. We need some fight and flight, but not all the time. But we need a lot more of this rest and digest here. So really, it's not about being one or the other. It's about these two characteristics working harmoniously with one another. And it's called to be in a state of relaxed alertness. And if you just witness the way the world's going now, it's getting quicker and quicker. People are losing their tempers more. Have you seen the state of the driving, especially those white van van men? You know, people are becoming more and more anxious, you know, exhausted and stuff like that. And so really, I just say to people is just become aware of your breathing. And I'll give you some techniques uh, at the end of this that may be helpful. So what we're really looking for is we're looking for the uh, the midpoint, if you like, between being bored and exhausted and depressed and driven, you know, anxiety, really. And this is another thing as well. Depressed people tend to look backwards, right? And they can be angry and resentful and stuff like that. And anxious people tend to look forwards. What we really need to do is practice the breathing technique to just live in this, what they call the eternal now moment. You know, and that's just a phrase that people use. But it's really just a situation where the two sides, the brake and the accelerator in your nervous system are working in harmony with one another and not fighting against one another. So just have a look at this. This will give you the clue. If you just look at her and say to yourself, you know, which way she's turning. Now, if she's turning clockwise, right, most people, two thirds of the population will see her turning clockwise. But at the same time, you might want to put it up on the uh, the comments there if you feel brave enough. And some people say she's changing, and I'm going to explain to you, she's not changing. Right. So I'll just put that up, go to the next one. And now the next thing is, if you just keep an eye on the middle one, and without moving your head, just cast your eyes to the left-hand side, you should see that one going clockwise. But keeping your head still, just cast your eyes to the right-hand side, you should see that one going anti-clockwise. But then if you practice it in a relaxed state and look to the middle one, you should see all of them going at the same pace in the same direction. Now, it can be very, very freaky, this, but this is really, um, it's called a talking therapy, but it's not really a talking therapy. This is 
eye movement desensitization and reprocessing right and this represents the way your hemispheres of your brain work and what tends to happen is when we're stressed you'll default to one or the other based upon the coping strategies that you developed as a child right and the idea is that if you're stressed and you go into these childish or childlike coping strategies then then really you know um you're only a half-hearted person really if you're stressful and you're just using these things these programs from childhood and that's what i realized is that most of my decisions when i was stressed were basically defensive and i was afraid all the time you know always pretending not to be you know so there was a lot of hard lessons for me to learn but once i started to accept this and accept this uh, programming in myself or the conditions that have been poured into me then i started to lose them then and see where you know the person who helped me he said to me joe just ask yourself where did i get this idea from and i got that most of my ideas are living from me mom god bless her you know and um, because she was frightened she was always trying to look after me right so everything that i tried to do for myself she goes oh son be careful or oh you don't want to do that and you know and so i tended to listen to my mother's fears and this is not a blame it's just that i see it very clearly you know now some people have the opposite they tend to go forward and they're you know if they're physically strong which i wasn't they can go forward and plow their way in you know so they have a problem softening up i had a problem toughening up but I was always I mean, I'd go to like martial arts, kung fu, and all that. But the physical wasn't my problem. It was the emotional side of my nature, and it took a long time for me to face that, you know. But thank goodness, I got there in the end. So just to say about that, what actually happens is if we if we look at the visual side of things, the lights coming in. It's hitting all these receptors at the back of that gives depth and color and stuff in our retina. That then's changing. Those photons are changing then into an electrical signal. So it's sending electrons down our nervous system. Now, this is the interesting bit. It goes down like a big wire and it goes to the back of our head. That's called the occipital cortex. That's where our visual processing happens. Now, the next thing is important. If it now goes to the right brain, you will see her turning clockwise. But if it goes to your left brain, you'll see her turning anti-clockwise. What we really should see is, we should be able to see it going one way and then on the next breath, the other way, so that they're actually working in harmony with one another. Anyway, it, as I say, I've got no time to, to go into this uh, in any more detail, but just have a look at the YouTube channel, only if you want to. So, um, yeah, nature can be cruel, but it really depends on how we look at things. Hang on, if somebody's put something in the chat here, let me see how I can do that. Okay, Shannon's gone, but, uh, but that's okay. Fair enough. Just bear with me, I'll come back to that now. Yeah, cruel and kind. So really, this is what I learned more than anything else is. Now, most people, including myself, I was just living, if you like, quite a shallow existence. And I was just living, ducking and diving and dodging and weaving. And I was always on my toes all the time, you know, waiting for the next challenge to come through. But I didn't realize that I'd, I'd repressed so much stuff below the level of my consciousness that it was really all this stuff in here that was making my decisions for me. So even though I gripped my teeth and said, I'm going to change, I'm not going to do these things again, I was always being hijacked by this deeper part of me. You know, but um, fortunately, I've been able to sort of turn my conscious mind to look at my subconscious mind and just deal with the bubbles that emerge once we start to relax. And by the way, more and more people will be finding it difficult to sleep They'll be finding things from the past emerging. They'll be, you know, all that sort of stuff. That's all part of this great big shift in consciousness that's happening across the globe. You know, everyone's being affected by this. And it's almost the time when we're having to turn our eyes inwards and start to basically uh, examine 
our actions and our behaviors and stuff like that with a view to changing them to be more self-caring because if we don't understand how to really care for ourselves we can't honestly care for anybody else because we just haven't got the sort of the base uh, understanding or the basement understanding and this is somebody who uh, who had a reasonable balance he was very left brain scientific but when he got chock-a-block with Woody and stress and tension as a human being, he used to get out on his bike, he'd go out on his dinghy, and he'd uh, sort of reset and restore the balance. Just want you to say, you know, I know some of you have seen this before, but just say to yourself what you see here. You know, and most people see, um, they see like a glass bottle with a cork in it, some message here. The bottle and sort of water, the whole picture in a sort of page with a turned up bit. But in actual fact, children, generally speaking, don't see this. Right. Most people see a naked couple here in a sort of passionate embrace, let's put it that way. Children don't see that. Children actually see nine dolphins. You know. And <laughs> this is just. Uh, uh, an experiment, not an experiment, but um, something to show you really how our unconscious mind is affecting the way that we see things as adults. You know, we become adulterated in a way, you know, and we lose that childhood innocence. But the children see nine dolphins. I had this slide for six months before I saw any dolphins. This was the first one I saw. Look, there's the tail. One dolphin, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine dolphins. And basically, what we're supposed to be able to do if our hemispheres of our brain are working properly, we're supposed to be able to see both sides of that, the naked couple and the dolphins as well. And that means that our brains are in coherence and working correctly. You know, So that's a, that's a really interesting one. Now, when I found that, it was like a godsend, really, because it just proves the point so sort of well. So just to finish this off, really, how can we create space to help ourselves to relax and recuperate, right? And have more space to think more clearly, to breathe more easily, to get more enjoyment out of life and not to burn our energy so foolishly. This is how we do it really is. You can put your hand on your heart and you can imagine that you're actually breathing the warmth of your hand. Or, as I say, you can bring a picture into your mind of something that brings with it a lovely, we'll call it a loving feeling, a caring feeling. And then you can dismiss the picture and just stay with the feeling. So this is focus on feelings first. And what tends to happen is, as you sink deeper into relaxation, your head will jump in They'll say, oh, it's bored in this. It's too, far too simple. This can't possibly work. That's the enemy. Right. And so don't fight with it. Just firmly say to it, hang on a second. Right. We're going to try this out because by all accounts, we'll both benefit from this. So the more that you practice this, the more that your head understands, oh, they've gone into that quiet time again. I'll give them a break. And what tends to happen is more space comes, clearer thinking comes, better choices come and the quality of your life improves. And then you can see clearly what's going on in the world and actions that you take or not take and stuff like that, you know, because it is a difficult, confusing um, time at the moment. And it's becoming more and more pressurized and more intense. So I just sort of what they say, I beg of you with all the earnestness at my command is just um, maybe be open minded about what's being said here, because this has definitely saved my life. Right. And so if you don't just put one hand on there, you can put the other over your tummy and over towards where your spleen is. And you can almost like imagine, and I call this cradling the sacred child. You can imagine that you're snuggling a child in, right? And you're almost listening to its heartbeat and trying to get its heartbeat and your heartbeat to beat in time with each other, you know. And the more that you get into this, the more you can relax the more you get a feeling of, uh, well, I won't explain the feelings. I'll let you sort of feel these yourself. And if emotions start to come up from the depth, 
that's a really really positive sign don't swallow them down keep your throat and your jaw and the root of your tongue relaxed and allow the emotions to emerge and just breathe them away because that's all part of this balancing process really so rather than pretending to be brave just you know I, I cried my leg off for about three months when all this came up but the people that were helping me they explained to me that it was just years and years and years of trying to be brave and putting on a brave face and it was time to stop all that really and get honest with myself you know so I'm coming out of this now. Um, it's quarter two now. Um, I'm what I'm doing now is I, I I don't know I didn't know I expected more people to actually come on live. Um, poor old Shannon's um, she's gone now. I was going to have a chat with her, but um, I'm all alone, which is okay. I understand why people don't want to come on and talk about their problems. Um, I'm not available, unfortunately, to do one-to-one -one stuff. I'm far too busy, and I receive lots of emails and lots of messages and stuff, and sometimes I have to ignore them because I'm so busy. I'm not being rude. It's just that I'm managing my own time and my own energy as well, you know. So so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to sort of look at um, look at my the comments here, and if anybody wants to, hello, Roxanne, my love, Leanne. Oh, lovely, lovely. Lynn Marie, let me just have a look at this here while we do this. Ah, Vinny, hiya, Vinny. Make a pathway, Louise. Happy birthday, plus one day, my darling. Let's have a look. Pete, my brother. Hello, Peter. Julie, hello, Julie. I hope you're, um, I hope you're getting sorted out. You've had a tough time as well. I do watch, you know, but sometimes I just can't get in touch with people. So. Mella, hello, Mella, my love. Nice to see you. All right, let me just see these comments here. Thanks very much, Janice. Love you too. So there we are. You know, I've um, I haven't got it cracked. Um, I'm getting more and more information all the time. I think what works, well, how it works is with the human being or me, if you like, is that we're born and we work from instincts initially. And then we develop as we grow some sort of intellect based upon the knowledge that's fed us, mostly the wrong way around, you know, because I think that the education system is basically upside down, you know. So more and more people are turning to homeschooling now and to earth schools. And I'm very much in favor of that, you know, um, because to allow the individual to grow themselves rather than be sort of forced in a direction that they're not naturally inclined towards. So I'm I'm very much into that, you know, and I think more and more people are being honest about it as well. Um, there are homeschooling. Um, I've got some friends who are uh, homeschooling experts and stuff, you know, but there's a lot of websites out there now that can give you information if you need that as well. I'm not trying to cause trouble. All I'm doing is expressing how I feel based upon what's happened to me. I didn't realize that more than anything else, I was simply a programmed automaton, but I didn't know, you know. And the other thing is I was in denial for a long time because I knew at, at, at depth that I had to turn around one of these days and face myself, you know. Uh, but I tried to drink, I tried to drink to anesthetize that feeling for a long time. But, you know, it, it snuck up and got me in the end, and I'm glad that it did. Um, so, yeah. The path to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think what's going on in the world, especially in the world of medicine is, I think there's a lot of people who work in medicine that don't realize the sort of subtle underlying agendas that are going on and stuff like that, you know, but that's a story for another day. And I think, how do you, how do you know what's best for you? Because some people might need to go on a low carbohydrate diet. Some people might need to go on a completely different diet. You know, how do you know what's best for you? All I can say is take all the the different voices, put them into a package, shove it into your heart and sit with it and almost inquire of your heart of hearts. What's the best way forward? And I swear to you, because I mean, I've helped a lot of people with this and they've helped me as well. I swear to you that there's a there's a deeper part of us called our intuition. That means to be taught from within that will inspire you 
and almost clearly guide you as to what to eat, which direction to go in and all that sort of thing. It's almost like a collaboration um, for with head and heart, but being guided by your heart first, you know. So there we are. Oh, denial. I, I love denial. You know, don't even, uh, di didn't even or don't even notice I am lying, you know. But I had a sort of suspicion that I was lying to myself all the time, you know. So there we are. I hope that you've got something from that. Let me just have a feel. We've got 10 minutes to go. I'll, um, let's have a look. So what can I say to people based upon my own experiences? If you're finding it really difficult, you know, is to sink deep into your heart and just ask the question, is there anybody in there? <laughs> you know, because that's what I do. I have this relationship now with this deeper part of me. Some people call it a higher power, spirit, whatever. I don't, I'm not bothered about what it's called. It's just a feeling for me. And I allow this feeling, well, as soon as I wake up, I tap on my heart and I say, hello, what are we doing today? What's on the cards today? And I just sort of relax. I wait for sort of um, pictures, if you like, and thoughts to emerge from here. It doesn't work this way down anymore. It used to. But it seems to it's I seems to get sort of like pictures and things that emerge up from my heart. That's all I can explain it as really. I'm sure there's some people out there who can explain it better, but I try and keep things as simple as possible. I really live to the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 step recovery program because that's another thing that guided me back to my heart. You know, it didn't brainwash me. Well, actually, in a way, it did. It helped me to brainwash because I needed to wash away all the programs that were basically destroying me just to be left with um, the original sort of program in me, my essential self. Right, so I'm getting on my own nerves now, so I'm, I'm going to go, but um, I hope that you've got something from this. Um, the last session of the I Am Approach will be in a fortnight's time, um, and I'll try and bring every, everything together in a clear straightforward way just let me have a little feel here about what's going on yeah feels all right to me and that's what i go with really i, I go oh something i've learned as well that if something happens and you feel emotionally disturbed if somebody says something and you get triggered by it right it's not what they've said really it's our reaction to it really and what it really means to me is that in order to be triggered, it's almost like fishing, really. That uh, a hook has gone into us, but it must have been able to hook onto something. So it's, where is it hooked onto? Have a look what that is. I learn the lesson from it, and then breathe it away then. And then we can start, if it's, it works the same way for you, you can start to sort of move forward in life then and become less triggered and stuff like that, you know. So I sort of see in a way that the triggers are almost like um, a lesson or a gift. <laughs> find that hard sometimes, you know, uh, that the triggers are a gift to point out to us what we're projecting outwards and what's reflecting back. Anyway, I'm starting to go into all that metaphysical guru speak now. So on that note, oh, look, I've got a spot there. Look at that. Oh, must be where the unicorn's horn's going to come out, you know, as I spiral forward into the cosmos. Anyway, all right, I'm going now. And um, thanks very much for tuning in and um, listening. And um, let me just feel my way now. I think I'm going to be on next week. Well, I'm, I'm doing stuff with Kristen as well. Kristen Van Besset, right? The Oracle from Oslo in Norway. I'm doing some stuff with her at the moment. And um, also... I'm having a chat probably next week. My good old friend, Sifu Boggy, you know, Paul Brighton, Sifu Boggy, master of everything, master of the universe. Okie dokie. So on that note, may the force remain with you forever and ever. And um, I'll speak to you again soon. Bye bye.